Game of Thrones Season 5, the season it all started to fall apart. Despite the downward spiraling of Tyrion's character and the systematic lack of substance, Season 5 still has its moments of brilliance. Perhaps running on the fumes of the source material was what allowed this season to remain so popular in so many eyes, even in retrospect. An okay season, all things considered, I suppose. But at Culture Vulture, we don't let billion dollar shows get away with okay, I suppose. And this is every error, baby, so let's get into it. The season starts out strong with Stannis walking talking John along the wall, but after stopping to make a point, he turns and walks the other way before reaching any sort of destination. When Varys compliments Tyrion for his accomplishments as Hand of the King, Tyrion for whatever reason starts arguing with Varys and offers a bunch of nonsense arguments as to why he's not that competent after all. And then this happens again in episode 2. Jon and Mance have a great conversation about bending the knee or not, very back and forth until Mance abruptly ends the exchange with this. You're a good lad. Truly, you are. But if you can't understand why I won't enlist my people in a foreigner's war, there's no point explaining. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess neither the viewer nor Jon, who on several occasions risked his life in order to understand and help the wildlings, doesn't deserve so much as an explanation. When rejected at the House of Black and White, Arya throws the priceless coin given to her by Jacken in the water, just like that. She'd previously witnessed the respect the Bravosi have for the coin, so throwing it away so easily makes no sense, especially for someone who has nothing but the clothes on her back. But it's fine, because in the next episode the coin is conveniently returned to her anyway. When Podrick alerts Brienne that Sansa Stark is in the same tavern as they are, she tells him to ready the horses in the event that they need to escape. But when Podrick points out that they only have one horse, she tells him to find more. As if horses grow on trees, and as if Podrick is a moron for not knowing that. Then, after shooting her shot and being rejected by Sansa, Brienne is invited to stay at Littlefinger's table, but when she refuses, Littlefinger's men try to kill her. And while it does make sense to prevent Brienne from blowing Sansa's cover, surely finding a way to take her out quietly is the sensible thing to do, rather than starting an all-out brawl. Brienne then breaks a log in two with a swing of her newly sharpened Valyrian steel sword. Oh, careful, your grace. Nothing breaks a log like Valyrian steel. Consider also that a few moments later she uses the same sword to cut through another sword, plus the guy's armor. She then loses the men chasing her with this convenient maneuver. How she managed to do that without being seen is just beyond comprehension. While referring to Dorne, Jamie wrongly uses the expression As far south as south goes. The correct use of the expression does not involve specifying the location. Also, Bronn agreeing to go along on Jamie's suicide mission to Dorne is totally against his self-preserving character. Cersei is suddenly the spokesman of King Tommen, who is inexplicably absent from his small council meetings. Now, this could all make sense, like in the books where this happens because Tommen is much younger than in the show. But we never get to see so much as a single scene where Cersei persuades Tommen to stay away and let her speak on his behalf. In season 4, Tywin even encouraged him to listen and learn from his elders, so being absent from the meetings where his elders convene just doesn't add up. After the Night's Watch have all cast their tokens to choose their new Lord Commander, instead of simply pouring out the tokens for counting, the perfectly fine ceramic urn is smashed to pieces for cinematic effect, making it difficult to conduct another voting if necessary. Throughout the history of the Night's Watch, it's not uncommon that the voting process has to be repeated several times before a winner is decided. The Waif comes to Arya on her own initiative to play the game of... Faces? This version of the game is very different from the one in the books, as it lacks any educational touch due to its unclear and brutal nature. In the books, the game is simply called The Lying Game and doesn't involve any face shifting as the show name suggests, so why exactly did they change the name in the first place? After having been lectured about the coin she so recklessly threw away, Arya throws it in the water yet again. Is she serious? Dude, just hand it back if you're not gonna keep it. It's clearly very valuable and they'll know you threw it away, stupid b When Cersei arrives at Flea Bottom to speak with the High Sparrow, nobody so much as reacts to her star-spangled presence. The fact that no one so much as gives her a second look is quite unrealistic. Compare this to the attention she gets later on when she goes on her Walk of Atonement. 
also worth keeping in mind is that Cersei has a deep disgust for the common folk and that she was attacked in the streets along with Joffrey when the people weren't fed in season two. But because these are deeply religious people, Cersei feels perfectly safe around them despite them previously having tried to kill her. The interaction between Tyrion and the prostitute in Molantis makes little sense as she, for whatever reason, assumes that he doesn't have any money. Tyrion, in turn, starts hinting at being Tyrion Lannister to convince her otherwise, which he really shouldn't be doing considering the bounty on his head. Episode 4 starts with Jorah's Hollywood knockout. Then there's Bronn who makes a very good point of asking why the very recognizable Jaime Lannister goes on an undercover mission to Dorne, and Jaime's reply simply being, It has to be me. And whilst I'm sure we can all think of reasons why it indeed should be Jaime, It has to be me. I'm also sure that we can all think of even more reasons why it shouldn't. Sam supersedes Brienne in not letting the ink dry as he stacks freshly signed letters on top of each other. Then, upon landing in Dorne, Jaime and Bronn waste the opportunity to use the cover of night to sneak into the country. And just like Bronn eventually points out, this leads to a Dornish search party finding them. Then, when the Dornish rider charges at Bronn, the horse inexplicably stops to be slashed at, with its momentum cancelled out somehow. Daenerys asks Missandei's opinion on how to deal with the Masters and the Sons of the Harpy. When Missandei admits to not being fit to have an opinion on the matter, Daenerys makes this nonsensical argument. You are as fit as anyone I know. You know why I'm here. And you know who will suffer the most if this all falls apart. So, what do you think? After being attacked by stone men in Valyria, Jorah and Tyrion somehow managed to go all the way from over here to here without Tyrion waking up or dying on the way. When Jacken comes to test Arya's skills at lying, he strikes her when he detects a lie. But when Arya mentions how she hates Sandor Clegane, Jacken strikes her despite her being sincere. After Jaime and Bronn conveniently clash with and get apprehended together with the Sand Snakes in the Water Gardens, the guards somehow know exactly where to also find Ilaria to arrest her as well. Then there's Olena Tyrell's carriage stopping just so that she can make a snappy comment. Oh, you can smell the shit from five miles away. Well, why have we stopped? Go on! Then, after Loras is hearing at the Sept of Baylor, Olena affirms that Well, I think that's quite enough of that. But moments later offers no protest when the Faith calls Marjorie to testify against her own brother. After Theon snitches on Sansa and hands over her rescue candle to Ramsay, Ramsay somehow figures out who gave her the candle in the first place, without any information to go on. The slave auction for Jorah is abruptly ended before other bidders are able to bid higher. Do I hear 60? 16! 20! So. Then the same buyer gets Tyrion for a price set by himself, again leaving other bidders in the dust. And when Jorah sees Daenerys attending the fighting pit, he goes out to fight but leaves his hard-earned prisoner Tyrion chained in the locker room despite him being the key to her side. Luckily, there's this guy. Just who and why? <laughs> then back in Marine, in his first audience with Daenerys, Tyrion is asked to advise her on what to do with Jorah, advice which she heeds in a heartbeat. Arya advertises her oysters, clams and cockles in the common tongue instead of Bravosi. Oysters, clams and cockles! Daenerys and Tyrion talk about stopping the metaphorical wheel that crushes the people beneath it. Until Daenerys makes the snappy point that I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. Which, in the context, means the exact same thing as stopping the wheel. Over at Hardhome, the White Walkers commence their attack, where Whites and their brittle skeleton arms are able to punch holes through the wooden gate. Then there's this White Walker grabbing and throwing Jon instead of just killing him. One when the giant escapes into the icy sea, and then what? He's too large to get on a boat, and he'll freeze to death if he stays in the water, so how in the world did they eventually get him to Castle Black alive? Despite being arrested on suspicion of treason, Elaria is allowed to attend a diplomatic meeting with Jaime. 
Instead of planning just a tiny bit ahead, Arya takes out the poison, the poison for the Thin Man, the poison chosen especially to kill the Thin Man, the Thin Man's poison. Yes, that poison. And puts it in her purse right in the middle of the square for everyone to see. Then goes on to act real strange in front of her target, drawing unnecessary attention to herself. Elaria and the Sand Snakes are strangely enough allowed to go free despite having committed treason, and especially Elaria, who made her position very clear when she poured out her wine in protest of the Martell alliance with the Lannisters. It makes no sense to set them free. And in the books, whilst this tension does exist between them, Doran gets the Sand Snakes on his side by revealing his master plan of getting revenge on the Lannisters eventually. But because he's such a dumbass in the show, he ends up getting killed instead. Daenerys decides to stir up some drama by questioning his star's knowledge of fighting pit winning statistics. I've spent much of my life in this arena, and in my experience, larger men do triumph over smaller men far more often than not. Has your experience ever involved any in actual fighting? Not really relevant, is it? Then there's this. And this. And then finally, when fighting breaks out and the sons of the Harpy have Daenerys and company surrounded, they send forward only one person at a time, instead of attacking all at once. To finish the season off, we see Sansa using a corkscrew to pick a lock. Yes, a corkscrew. <laughs> Then, the battle at Winterfell begins and Stannis, who was first on the front line against the Boltons, somehow makes it out alive and all the way into the forest. Then, when Brienne conveniently finds him beaten and alone in the woods, she sentences him to die in the name of Renly Baratheon, the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms, when she knows that not to be true. In the name of Renly of House Baratheon, first of his name, rightful king of the Andals and the First Men. If anything, he was the preferred king of the Seven Kingdoms. Titles, titles. The execution scene ends without actually showing Stannis dying, so viewers are left hanging until his death is confirmed only in season 6. Also, the Boltons never bothered to confirm Stannis' death either while on the battlefield. In season 6, they even acknowledged their own ignorance. Thanks to you, the false king Stannis Baratheon is dead. Do you know who struck the killing blow? No. A shame. When the escaping Sansa is apprehended by Miranda, she says she prefers to be killed quickly on the spot rather than to be tortured to death by Ramsay. Miranda then says that she can't hurt her because Ramsay needs her to make heirs, but then you turns on all that in the very same breath and is about to hurt Sansa anyway. Luckily, Theon throws Miranda to her death. As if that wasn't bad enough, in order to escape the consequences of their actions, Sansa and Theon jump some 30 meters to a certain death. Remember, the Lord of Light just melted the snows before the battle the very same day. The Lord of Light has made good on his promise, my king. His fires have melted the snows away. But of course, they survive. In season 2, Jacken befriends Arya because she stole from the many-faced god by saving him and two others from a certain death. A debt was owed because people were saved, and Jacken carried out three murders as compensation. But here, after Arya kills Meryn Trant, a debt is somehow owed because someone was killed rather than saved. That man's life was not yours to take. A girl stole from the many-faced god. Now a debt is owed. Wait, how does that make any sense? <laughs> Only death can pay for life. Wait, wait, what? He for what life? He died. Ugh, get your religion straight, man. And he's dead. But they couldn't just kill off a likable character just like that, could they? Surprise, motherfucker! It turns out they have copies of people's faces, including their voices. Which makes you wonder why they even bother taking dead faces instead of just making new ones. And to top off this masterpiece of a scene, they make Arya magically go blind. That's right, no poison milk like in the books, no clever tricks, just straight up magic, baby. Over in Dorne, Elaria survives the poison while Myrcella dies, despite having been in contact with it for much longer. Then in Marine, after Daenerys having flown off on Drogon, we have Tyrion going against his character by suggesting that he should tag along on the expedition to find Daenerys, despite obviously being better suited to stay behind. Plus the bounty on his head still being a thing. Speaking of Daenerys, here she is walking around aimlessly when she really should be looking for food. Then, when the Dothraki horde shows up, some of the riders suddenly appear, nay, spawn, on the cliffside. Also, how did she not see the rest of the massive horde coming from miles away? Over at Castle Black, Melisandre somehow knows the outcome of Stannis' battle at Winterfell, despite riding out of camp long before it began. Your grace. 
that Eddie Melisandre was just seen riding out of camp. Varys seems to have gone from a mysterious rogue to a clear-cut Targaryen supporter overnight, removing everything that used to be interesting about his character. His only true ally in the world was supposedly Illyrio Mopatis, but now he trusts and believes in Daenerys before having even met her. Arya never gets to learn the Bravosi language, even though that seems like a vital thing if she's ever going to lie and pretend to be other people in Bravos. On the other hand, everyone conveniently speaks the common tongue to her for some reason anyway, so there's that. You. You. What have you got there? Your rice is fresh. Best in the city. You wouldn't lie to an old man, would you? I said clams and cut! How much for your little clam? <laughs> <laughs> then there's the Waif, a total hard-ass who, despite supposedly being no one, free from personal desires and all, continuously obstructs Arya's training and clearly dislikes her. Jaime's trip to Dorne is completely pointless and totally insane from a Lancer point of view. That's the water gardens. Once we've got the princess, then what? I like to improvise. That explains the golden hand. <laughs> They've just had their daughter threatened, and instead of gathering leverage, they send another prized family member straight into the hands of their foes. And in the end, it turns out that Prince Doran is super diplomatic and easy to deal with anyway. The whole subplot is pointless and doesn't lead anywhere. Marcella, Tristane and Doran all die in the end, sure, but that would have happened anyway. Jamie certainly wasn't needed for that. The whole Sons of the Harpy plot throughout Season 5 is also really lackluster, as any fight scenes have neither substance, build-up, nor lasting effect on the story, apart from randomly killing off Sir Barristan. Events and action scenes being completely hollow starts becoming a theme after Season 5, and pretty much all suspense is sucked out of the show as the plot armor thickens. It's not surprising that most people were fine with season 5. It does have some great moments to compensate for the bad, and considering the slight drop in overall quality from season 4, it doesn't look glaringly terrible in comparison. All in all, it keeps up the Game of Thrones tone well enough, but the cracks are really starting to show, and the spiraling downwards trend only continues in season 6. Did you agree with what I said in this video? Did I miss something? Let me know in the comments. Next up is every error in season 6, so make sure to subscribe not to miss it. If you want to support this channel, giving it a like really helps, and a comment even more so. I recently started a Patreon page in order to speed up production, so check that out as well if you feel like supporting the channel. Thank you very much in advance, and thank you all for watching.